Hello, my name is David Armstrong, and today's webinar is entitled, How Can We Prepare Our Workforce for Future Care Needs of Those with Serious Illness? Our presenters are Joanne Spetz, Karen Donnellan, and Michelle Washko. Now, after the presentation, you may ask questions using the chat panel. Also, when the event ends, you will be directed to a short evaluation survey, so please take a few moments to provide us with your feedback. And with that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn the event over to Joanne, our first presenter. Thank you very much, David. Um, and thank you to those of you who are here. I know that there are some people who wanted to attend and were unable, so fortunately this will be recorded and posted on the Workforce Center Technical Assistance Center webpage. So please share that information with anybody you know who might be interested, and we'll be sure that we tweet it out and share it when we know that the link is live. So I wanted to talk today about a project that we completed, um, or are now really completing, uh, that was supported by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, focusing on developing recommendations to ensure an adequate workforce for the care needs of people with serious illness. The other presenters here, Karen Donnellan and Michelle Washko, were both involved in this project as members of the planning committee and were in attendance at the summit as well. We know that the growth in serious and complex illnesses among our population increases the need for a well-prepared workforce. This is a project that's very much focused on the United States, but this really is a global issue. Individuals who are living with serious illness in the community face a lot of barriers to receiving good care. There's a lack of an adequately prepared workforce, which is a critical barrier. And there are many other barriers, including financing issues, geographic um, access issues, social and economic problems, and so on. But we were focusing on the workforce barriers. There have been a lot of recommendations to address this problem over the years, including a landmark report published by the Institute of Medicine just over a decade ago. But progress towards change has been much slower than we would all hope. So we convened a workforce summit to review the recommendations that were previously made, propose new ideas, and to prioritize the recommendations with a focus on recommendations over the next three to five years. So we really wanted to aim at things that would be relatively actionable. Thus, recommendations like we should change the entire healthcare payment system in order to um, you know, encourage better use of whatever kind of worker, those things were discussed, but it was recognized that that was not really achievable in three to five years, and we wanted then to bring that back to what components of that type of recommendation could happen in a three to five year period, and really try to keep ourselves focused on the relatively short term period. For this summit, it was held in May 2018, just about one year ago in Napa, California, we had a planning committee of national experts. Uh, as I mentioned, Michelle Washko and Karen Donnellan were among that group. We had the summit organized in order to prioritize and really begin to build out action plans for the recommendations. To some extent, we wanted to try to achieve what a good Institute of Medicine panel can achieve. However, we only had two and a half days to do it, and the IOM panels often have at least a year. But we tried to create a lot of intensity and really drive quickly through the agenda in order to get some recommendations on the table and begin to flesh them out. We did that by having discussion papers that were put together into three half-day panels. Those discussion papers were presented very briefly, and then there was a reaction panel of three of the attendees to discuss their takeaways from those discussion papers and other things that they might add in a brief period of time. We then broke out all the participants into various breakout groups that had about six to seven people each to prioritize the recommendations that have been put forward in those discussion papers, as well as that have been put forward by the reaction panel and other ideas that they had of things that might have been missing in the presentations and discussion to date. Those breakout groups were rotated every single breakout session. So there was, in general, nobody was in the same breakout um, people with the you know, same other people twice. 
So we really wanted to create a lot of diversity in those initial breakout groups to generate new ideas and new kinds of interactions between the individuals participating. After those three half-day panels, we then had an afternoon during which we focused on prioritizing the recommendations. So breakout groups were established to put people together to go through all the recommendations that had come out of the earlier breakouts and prioritize them. And then at the very end of the day, um, to some extent, quite literally on the bus ride to dinner that night, we voted to create a prioritized list. Then our last half day, we broke people into groups and people were selected, uh, were able to select their own groups at that point to really begin to focus on the nuts and bolts of what an action plan for each of the recommendation areas could look like. Um, and certainly those action plans are not complete, but they did give us a blueprint for what kinds of pathways we need to take going forward to implement these sorts of recommendations. So who was attending this? We had 40 attendees covering a range of different kinds of organizations and um, players in this space. So we had academic participants, of course, no surprise there, being an academic myself. We also had individuals from various professional organizations, including the American Geriatric Society, AACN, N4A, the American Board of Family Medicine, and the American Occupational Therapy Association. We had government recommend uh, representatives from HRSA, including Michelle and her colleague Joan Weiss, as well as from the Department of Veterans Affairs. We had people from various nonprofit organizations that are active in this area, advocacy organizations, including unions, payers and business organizations, such as Optum, Centene, Kaiser Permanente, and United Health Team MD, and then foundations that have active programs in the long-term care and aging population spaces. So it's a good diversity of individuals. And one of the individuals who attended noted in their comments that there were a few people in the room that they did not know, which was good. We wanted to bring in people who wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to work together on this kind of an agenda. The commission discussion papers covered seven different topics, ranging from advanced care planning through com clinician communications, looking at the cultural competence of the workforce, the palliative care workforce, how to best support family caregivers and direct care workers, such as personal care aides, and linking patients with social services. We came up with 16 overarching recommendations that I'll now summarize. The first area of recommendations focused on expanding the pipeline of people available and prepared to work in providing care for those with serious illness living in the community. The first recommendation was that education programs across all health professions need to increase clinical experiences in the care of people with a serious illness during the pre-licensure and certification phases, and that healthcare systems should actively offer such experiences to support those pre-licensure and pre-certification programs. We pointed to a number of different exemplars in this area. There have been various efforts and various curricula developed which have been adopted at varying levels across different health professional programs. Um, a lot of those programs don't necessarily connect to other professions. So while there is a growing use of interprofessional education, there is still a long way to go. We don't often find interprofessional education programs, for example, that include occupational therapists and physical therapists. Um, we often don't find them linking together social workers with physicians. And so these kinds of connections um, can occur in a lot of care settings. Of course, we had representatives at the meeting from Virginia Commonwealth University that have some really nice innovative programs. And the VA is an organization that trains a tremendously large number of people in the long-term care and older population workforce. And so there is very likely much more that they can do as well as things that they are doing now that other organizations can learn from. The second recommendation was that Congress should ensure funding of relevant programs such as the Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program. And um, probably not due to our tremendously great work out of the summit, this actually was done recently. The Congress actually has reauthorized the GWEP program and they kind of rolled into that the old uh, Geriatrics Academic um, 
oh, the GACA, I'm now forgetting the acronym, but another acronym that, or another program that was aimed more at people in the academic setting that were going to be involved in geriatrics education and training. My understanding is that some, uh, some bipartisan legislation that was looking at palliative care that was similar to the GWEPs, but it was focused on palliative care is still in process. We'll see if that goes through. But as a group, we felt that that federal bolus of funding, especially because the GWEP program has been so innovative, really helps to spur the education system forward and led to a lot of collaborative change within communities and linking community programs with the academic programs in ways that hadn't been done previously. Our third recommendation was that healthcare leaders need to advocate for payment models that incentivize working in geriatrics, gerontology, palliative care, and team-based care. And while we don't imagine that that kind of payment reform is gonna happen in three to five years, advocacy and supporting these kinds of payment models can happen immediately. To the degree that we are able to develop payment systems that really support the work of geriatrics and palliative care and team-based models of care, we're going to better be able to meet the needs of people with serious illness living in the community. Um, and this is going to be an ongoing challenge. We're seeing more and more payment moving into value-based payment models, but those models don't always incentivize the kinds of care that people with serious illness really need. So there was a, a lot of agreement among the room that we could not leave this recommendation alone that we needed to make a statement about its importance. The second domain of recommendations was around incorporating family caregivers into healthcare teams. Um, this is a really important area of work because we need to recognize that family caregivers provide the bulk of care and supportive services to those with serious illness. Foundations and government funders should commission reviews of the literature on approaches that best support family members in the care of those with serious illness and prepare clinicians to work with family members as part of the care team. There is a lot of research that has been done on the needs of family caregivers, but it has been not really reviewed or brought together in a holistic way. So there was a sense among the summit participants that there was a really good, timely opportunity to bring that literature together, to summarize it, to create toolkits or resources so that it was easily accessible, and then to help push that knowledge out to education and training programs to not only help them develop more resources to support the family, but also prepare clinicians so that clinicians know better how to guide the family in seeking the support that they need and in communicating with them and incorporating them into their clinical work. The fifth recommendation was that stakeholder organizations need to do that dissemination, and there are many stakeholder um, organizations that are engaged in this space, as well as new, relatively new organizations, such as the Family Caregiver Institute at the University of California, Davis, that can be involved in this kind of work. The next domain of recommendations was around supporting the home care workforce. And by home care workforce, we were focusing primarily on personal care aides, which are also known as home care assistants or home care aides, and home health aides, who have a slightly greater degree of training, but there's often a lot of movement between home care and home health workforce. Recommendation number six was that dual Medicare and Medicaid programs should be providing incentives and creating programs to improve home care worker pay and working conditions. Summit participants viewed the dual eligible programs as a great opportunity for this because one of the challenges in creating incentives for better pay and better working conditions and training for home care aides is that home care programs are generally paid by Medicaid. And the costs of Medicaid are primarily with the state, generally about 50-50 between the state and the federal government. So if you increase the costs of home care the state is going to have an increase in its Medicaid budget. But if that increase in home care worker skills, satisfaction, and reductions in turnover results in um, better outcomes and, say, lower uses of emergency departments and lower hospitalization rates, the primary beneficiary of those changes would normally be Medicare, which is fully federal. So states are kind of in a difficult position where they may want to do this because they know it's the right thing, but financially there's no return on investment for them. So they may be putting out extra money 
and not regaining any of the benefits of that. And if their budgets are tight, it simply becomes unaffordable. With the dual eligible population, however, there's more of an incentive because the state then does have some obligation to the cost of the emergency department and the other expenses that are associated with the older population, and therefore they would have more value to them as states in engaging these kinds of efforts. So we view that as a target of opportunity. Recommendation number seven was related to that in that leading models for home care aid training should be adopted by all state Medicaid programs and regulatory agencies. There's been research conducted in the past by my colleague Susan Chapman here with PHI, I'm Abby Marcond who was at PHI at the time, looking at personal care aid training requirements across states and they are highly inconsistent. There are relatively few states that even have them and those that have them often have different requirements based on whether the client is a younger person with a disability versus an older person with a disability, and whether you're looking at private pay programs or Medicaid programs or even different tracks within the Medicaid program. That said, there are some states, including Washington State, that have stepped forward as leaders and developed very comprehensive, forward-thinking, home care aid training programs often associated with career ladders. And those best players can be looked at as exemplars that other states should follow. The work that Abby Marcond and Susan Chapman did highlighted seven leading states. Um, you can find that report on the UCSF Health Workforce Research Center's website. And there are probably other programs that have evolved even in the few years intervening since that report. Those kinds of models should be adopted. And if states think about them in the context of their dual eligible programs, they may have a financial incentive to do so as well. Then recommendation number eight follows on those two recommendations in that we need more rigorous studies about the impact of higher pay, lower turnover, and better training for home care aides on client outcomes and total health care costs. I recently was looking at the literature in this area and it is quite surprising. Well, we have a lot of literature growing on the value of community health workers, the value of medical assistance with enhanced skills and health coaching, and other um, types of models of care. We have painfully little evidence and research that has ever been attempted to look at how training of home care aides affects the quality of care and the client outcomes. There's a huge opportunity here and a huge need for this research in order to guide the training programs that can be developed and enhanced and revised over time and to guide the payment incentives that should be provided to adopt these kinds of training programs. The next domain of recommendations was around leveraging technology to advance patient-centered team care. And there were several different areas that we discussed at the summit. Recommendation nine was that insurance companies should be pressuring purchasers of EHRs, in other words, hospitals and primarily physician groups, to demand modules that elicit and record patient goals of care, identify the full care team, and share that information across providers and settings. We are seeing this happen more and more. Um, actually, not long after the summit, United Health Group and Kaiser Permanente have both said that they are adding these kinds of um, components into their EHRs and that this is a very important initiative for them to address the social determinants of health. There also is a group called the SIREN Network that is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that's trying to organize such an effort to um, create common metrics across EHRs so that those metrics would be um, very consistent and be interoperable. So uh, there is more work to do in this area around ideally sharing this information across providers and settings, and I'm sure that we will have issues around HIPAA and privacy that we need to overcome. But the idea that the um, purchasers of EHRs really have more leverage over the vendors than they think, and that this is really important and they should use that leverage that they have to demand these kinds of modules. Recommendation number 10 was that the health IT developers also need to create systems to link electronic health record data on social determinants of health to social workers and community programs. We were aware of various pilot projects that were discussed during the summit 
that have been doing this, and also some private companies that are trying to create better resource modules and, and resource almost directories in order to enable clinicians to identify the social services that might be available in their community for their clients. We believed as a group of summit participants that this could be taken the next step forward to ideally make it possible for a clinician to share that social determinant information with, say, a community health worker program or with a social worker organization, led organization, that then could directly move those connections to the community forward. This was in part a re recommendation developed in recognizing that clinicians cannot possibly know all the community resources available. That really isn't in their job description, and while they want to do it to help their clients, I think we all agree that a lot of clinicians almost are scared to ask about these things because they don't know where to refer their patients. But if they have this kind of a resource available to them, it would be easier for them to elicit that information from their patients because then they would know that they could turn to a network in order to help meet those patients' needs. Um, it's very frustrating for clinicians to ask about a social issue or a home-based issue that a, a patient might have and for the patient to discuss it and then for the clinician to have to say, gee, I really don't know how to help you with that. And so um, making these systems more interoperable would really help this. Recommendation number 11 is really closely tied to those other two that we can look to the cooperative extension model that was established for agriculture many, many decades ago, that a, la a learning collaborative model similar to the cooperative extension model could be established in order to support technology advancement, to identify best practices, best modules, to help provide technical assistance for adoption and utilization of these kinds of best practices, and to do that on a regional level where then you could have these regional networks that could come together and continue to advance the field. Um, that cooperative extension model is really interesting, has been going on for a long time with tremendous success. And it um, actually is quite surprising that it hasn't been adopted in healthcare already for any number of the different areas in healthcare where we know there's room for improvement. The next area of, of recommendation was in advocating for payment models that support community-based, team-focused, serious illness care. We discussed the importance of Medicare Advantage plans actively offering services that meet enrollees' social needs. And as mentioned before, we know that United Health Group and Kaiser Permanente are both engaged in these kinds of efforts now, made big announcements about it over the past year. Um, they need to think about supporting clinicians as they are developing strategies to link patients to these services and engage in evaluation that ideally would be shared with the broader community about how these services are impacting quality and value of care. Summit attendees also recommended that the CMS expand the Independence at Home program, as well as other evidence-based programs to meet the needs of those with serious illness living at home. For those of you not familiar with Independence at Home, you should uh, take a look on the website. The year one and two evaluation reports look incredibly good in terms of the return on investment of having home and team-based care in geriatrics and gerontology for those with serious illness. This is only one of a various set of different kinds of programs you can find out there, but because it is part of CMS's Innovation Center, it has received a lot of attention and the initial results are incredibly promising. Another key area of recommendation was in instilling cultural competency and humility skills across all health professions. We recognize that foundations and government funders should create a national work group to define the minimum cultural humility and communication competencies and curricula for all healthcare providers. We know that you can find a lot of these different competencies and recommendations and curricula across the different health professions, but there has not been a lot done to create a common taxonomy, a common set of tools, and a common language and set of expectations across professions. Thus, there is a great opportunity to bring professions together to talk about what skills everybody should have, ranging from the home care worker to the advanced gero, uh, gero psychiatrist. Then, once you have identified those minimum criteria, licensing and certification boards and education credentialing boards should mandate inclusion of these recommended cultural humility and communication competencies in all pre-licensure and pre-certification programs and for continuing education. 
Now, that does not sound like a three to five year recommendation to say the least, but what some attendees recommended was that a single profession be selected, such as geriatric nursing or um, nurse practitioners or occupational therapists or home care aides. Select a single occupation that is certified or licensed and work maybe within one or two states to begin to develop those requirements and identify what it would take to really make this happen in a single state for one or two professions. And that would provide some impetus and some learning about how these kinds of um, skills can be standardized across health professions programs, brought into licensing examinations and credentialing requirements, be part of certification and credentialing of education programs, and move forward into continuing education requirements in the long term. The importance of the continuing education should not be understated because there is a very large incumbent workforce that still needs to develop their skills and develop their best practices. So while the entry-level workforce, of course, is important, we can't forget the fact that we have a large number of clinicians and other healthcare workers now that need training. Finally, we recommended that the workforce in this area be better tracked. It's amazing how little data that we have about the workforce that is meeting the needs of people with serious illness in the community. Uh, as a starting point, we recommended that there be a job analysis of emerging care coordination and navigation occupations to improve their definition and ensure inclusion in the standard occupational classification. We focused on these occupations because if any of you have ever tried to research community health workers and care navigators and care coordinators, you probably have realized that the standard occupation classification does not have a good place where all of those kinds of workers can be found. So it ends up being a hunting expedition and we end up with bad data about all of them. But we know that these are growing in importance and it would be very useful from a policy and practice standpoint to better understand where these kinds of jobs are appearing, what settings they're in, and then eventually to be able to build out into a better understanding of what their education needs are and the opportunities for improving that workforce and its integration with care. I'm sure that other professions and occupations are gonna be identified over time, but this was really a priority area that Summit attendees identified. So what are our next steps? Uh, there is a special issue of the Journal of the American Geriatric Society that was just released uh, within the past three days, literally, that has all the discussion papers and a paper summarizing the recommendations with much more detail. We're continuing to build out the recommendations, and there will be some other papers on the recommendations aimed at specific clinical or occupational um, professional groups. We're doing webinars such as this communicating with stakeholders directly, and what we really want to do is move these recommendations forward to meet the care needs of those with serious illness. And that is why we have you all here today to think about how this can best be done and move this agenda forward. So with that, I want to turn it over to Karen Donnellan, who can talk about some of her research that um, gets into integrated and interprofessional team-based care for older people and people with serious illness. Hi, everybody. I'm pleased to be with you today and to talk to you about a project that we've been working on for about three years now. This project is based here at Mass General but has involved researchers from across the country, and I'm pleased that Joanne has joined us for um, some aspects of the project. And our focus is particularly on frail older adults living in the community. So we'll talk a little bit about how we kind of narrowed our focus. Many of the things you've heard about are broadly for all people with serious illness, but we, we see particular needs of this population. So on the next slide, um, I want to show you kind of where we began um, with this funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. We recognize, as Joanne was talking about, that the roles of the workforce have changed quite a bit over time and that the, what physicians have done historically, what nurses have done historically, what some of these emerging roles, um, even what family members are doing historically in caring for um, frail older adults have changed. And so 
we began with a historical look on roles of patients and caregivers, social workers, nurses, and physicians in particular um, since Medicare when the world changed dramatically for this population. We then determined that we were going to look at the competencies of those professionals to look at the roles of professionals through both qualitative and quantitative survey work. And then try to use all of these data collectively to, to model some optimal staffing cost and efficiency of care models. We are, this is work in some ways in progress, so I'm sharing with you today some work from the development phase with an understanding that over the next few months you're going to see some of the, the papers um, in press. So how did we decide, so our, our first phase of this work was to visit sites of care in the community. We decided that we wanted a range of what we called autonomous versus collaborative practices. So we wanted to find places where physicians might be working more on their own, where nurse practitioners might be working more on their own, where social workers might be in the lead, and then we wanted things really across the continuum of care, from primary care to care management, um, hospital care, palliative care. We didn't really visit hospitals unless they were part of a system that had community-based care in them. So we intentionally were not focused here on inpatients. We wanted to look at models of care that were led by different members of teams, and we wanted to look at a range of ownership of organizational structure, sites of care, and, and ultimately the, the number of frail elderly or older adult patients that they are um, working with. And I want to acknowledge here a, a language issue that comes up a lot. We generally are talking, when we talk about people 65 plus, um, I think the world has sort of moved toward using the term older adult. A lot of the medical literature is still, when, when it comes to this frail part of the population, using the words frail elderly, but that's in transition, and I expect that will keep changing, as do most of our language issues. So, in general, you're going to hear me talking about older adults, but sometimes you will see the term frail elderly here. We also coupled our site visit strategy with, um, with focus groups, and we picked ultimately five cities to do both focus group work and site visit work. And one of the reasons for that is that we wanted to think about um, geographies where we had different, um, different aspects of the aging population. So we looked at areas where there were a lot of older adults moving in retirement. We looked at areas where there were large proportions of older adults, but where there wasn't a big influx of, of new people uh, migrating to those areas. And in these communities, we did clinician groups that had a mixture of health professionals, physicians, nurse practitioners, social work, um, advanced practice nurses, and we had informal caregiver groups with those caregivers, as Joanne were telling you about, who, who are doing an increasing amount of work in this for this population and that we don't really understand um, their inclusion in care teams. So our, our focus was not so much on only the things they, they do to support the person they care for, but also on how they work with the, the care teams of, of health professionals. And finally, we we screened for older adults who had a mixture of hospitalization, recent multiple illnesses, people who were more frail, had used more home-based or, um, or other health services so that we could look at this sort of higher need older adult population. Within both the site visits and our focus groups, we really focused on a few particular areas of interest to us. One was how did teams, how did healthcare teams interact to produce the, the kind of care that they were having um, or providing to older adults, whether that was care at home or care in an office or care in a residential care facility. 
We also wanted to ask them about their professional identity. What did they feel they did best? How did their training and education prepare them for their work in the setting they were working in? What, how did they think nurses or physicians or, or social work was best employed in those settings? We looked for direct interaction with patients and caregivers and what role these different professionals played in interacting directly with patients and caregivers. And then we had formed a long list of clinical activities through a review of the literature, the annual wellness visit activities, and a number of other activities that we thought were essential to the care of this population. And we were looking for who was providing those services and in what kind of teams. So I want to share first um, a few themes from, and I'm going to, I don't have time today to take you through themes from all of our focus group work, but I think the themes that I want to share with you from our, our groups with frail older adults underscore some issues that we heard about again and again as we interviewed um, more than 100 stakeholders across the systems and observed care for patients and, and led these focus groups. So the, the first slide shows you, I think um, I, I bolded the words, which ologist am I going to go see today? Because Really, what we see in this population is extensive use of specialty care. And in fact, if you track the use of specialty care by this population and you go back to about 1980, in 1980, older adults used about half of the office visits that they use today. And the majority of those visits were to primary care providers. And that has really flipped. And now the majority of visits are to specialist providers. And that may be due to primary care shortages, that may be due to the fact that hospital stays are shorter, but in general, life for this frail older population can be a real juggle of you know, which appointment, which specialist, and that, that has given rise to the need for more care coordination and care management, especially for people who may not be able to keep track of all those appointments and services themselves. Then, the, the other quote on this emphasizes, I think, a, an issue that, that we've seen. We know that falls are part of our definition of what a frail older adult is. We know that, that falls can be quite common and falls with injury or a frequent source of emergency care for older adult populations. And I think this, um, this quote illustrates for me the complexity of understanding falls when you have a person who you know takes a lot of joy out of having a pet but may also have some risk associated with having a pet and i think the the trade-offs for people of this age group in this population get very clear when when we think about that complexity you know of of their lives at this stage Another thing that we heard on the next slide here is that a lot of our older adults actually like to move around. They retire, they travel, they may move to new areas. And we heard from a few people that people traveled and then had a health event. And those health events then gave rise to kind of a cascade of, of services and needs that might not be based right where their primary care provider was in their hometown, but might be happening in an unfamiliar location somewhere else. And this can happen when they're visiting family or when they're on vacation. And so I highlighted three things in the first quote here, this I almost died on vacation. The next, the next part of this that I think was, was telling was this phrase, all my doctors were about my age. And we actually heard this a lot, that these older adults have been with the same providers and, you know, whether nurse practitioner or physician for a number of years, and they're aging together, essentially. But there may come a point where they have to make a transition to somebody else and that those things can be disruptive and leave them in a very complex health situation with people they don't know as well. And so facing that, that new transition of care can, can be hard for people. 
And then that coordination issue again, getting them all to coordinate, this can be as challenging as your corporate job. So again, we hear that theme of trying to wrangle all the physicians and all the, the nurses and all the specialty care. And then I, I thought I would share this, um, this final quote with you, which is really, and I, I think about some of the things Joanne was talking about with, with cultural humility, and I think many of us think of cultural competency as something which might only be about race or language or geography or gender, but for this particular population, when I think about cultural competency and humility, I also think about all of the aspects of the lives of frail older adults, the work they have done, the health they have experienced, the respect that they hope to, um, to receive. And I think respect is something which, you know, we all feel as a core human um, value that, that we would like to have throughout our lives, but, but especially as we age. And, and so this, um, this quote, I think, resonated with us a lot. People looked at you, smiled at you, respected you. We want people that will sit with us, look us in the eye, tell us the truth, and care about us. And those are four dimensions, I think, of something which at least to to this person and many of the people that we talk to is is the trust part of this equation. You know, how do we have teams that will do this for us? And I think about this a lot as we think about the emergence of virtual technology and telehealth technology, which can be incredibly valuable, but which also I think have to leave room for these personal and respectful interactions that people are hoping for. So I told you we visited several types of places and we went to, we, we, we organized them initially by kind of were they caring for frail older adults and, and what type of professional staffing they had. But we ended up across our cities looking particularly and finding particularly a, a number of practice types. We found people who were mainly focused on primary care for the most seriously ill. Um, this is a group that Joanne spent a lot of time talking about, but in our world of, of this study, many of these patients or persons were living at home or living in some sort of residential care that was not, you know, skilled nursing facility, but might be, you know. So in other words, PACE programs, you know, for um, all-inclusive care for the elderly, which is caring for a very serious group, seriously ill group of people who are able to be at home and to come into community in, in assisted um, centers, but who might otherwise be in a skilled nursing facility or nursing home. We also found many senior health practices, and Joanne was mentioning uh, Medicare Advantage. We found these senior health practices in the community, new venture finance startups, and I'll tell you about a few of those in a minute, but also more traditional senior health academic practices that were based in health systems or hospitals, but serving and delivering a, a range of care for people, um, usually 75 plus. We also visited some places that provide primary care for all ages, such as community health centers um, or Indian health service facilities, because we wanted to see what happened with people who were frail and older when they were in that kind of community setting. We saw a lot of care management, um, the themes that I mentioned earlier, essential services now that many accountable care organizations are providing, that many health systems are providing, but we also saw private community-based versions of these. So individuals, social work, nurses, um, physicians setting up shop in the community to try to serve consumers directly outside of health systems and help them navigate the health system from an external perspective. You also see care management from health plans. Um, and so there's a lot of care management and there's a literature here 
which really is struggling, I think, to define what is most effective in that space. And we think staffing may have a, a lot to do with that as we think about staffing cost and, and roles and how integrated care management is with the rest of people's care. We saw some really um, wonderful residential care programs that were more on the assisted living end of the spectrum for people with serious mental illness, for people with dementia or memory care challenges. And we, we visited several um, mobile health type programs. So I can't show you the full range of what we did. We went to 22 different sites and we, um, we did this over you know, much of a year. But I wanted to just give you a couple of visuals that show you the variation that we see. These are, are sort of archetypal sites. They may not be exact. But we, um, in the inner circle of these slides, you can see sort of a core team around a patient that might have a physician, a nurse, a social worker, or a physician, and an advanced practice nurse, and a social worker, and an RN. We also saw programs that had an unlicensed you know, health coach who was really there for the patient. Um, that coach might go by navigator, might go by the name coach, might go by you know, another kind of health worker, but many of our senior primary care models seem to be exploring that kind of support, not from a, a licensed professional, but from somebody who can kind of meet the patient where they are. You'll see in the outer circle, so using the same colors as the inner circle, these are standardized to a, a panel of a few hundred patients. You can see that the numbers of physicians and social workers and coaches and RNs actually you know, might vary quite a bit. And I can tell you over several of these sites, we never see images that are the same. The, the, the roles change, the full-time equivalents of the roles change, and it, it really shows a kind of variation that's happening out there that I can't say we didn't expect to find it, but I was, I was impressed uh, by the range of roles and, and models of care. We also looked at um, care management. I told you we spent a, a certain amount of time with that. And this, again, I would say predominantly in care management, we see nurses and social workers. But I would also say that we saw a, an incredible mix of nursing and social work. This is coming from, from our, our site visit project. But in our center here at Mass General, through um, a collaboration with the University of Wisconsin, with funding from PCORI, we're following these roles of nurses and social workers and, and sort of caseloads and contacts with patients and, and what building those integrated teams into primary care looks like. So that's work that, that will be continuing. I wanted to show you, and this, this slide may be a bit dated in terms of the actual dollars, but I wanted to show you that at the same time as we see health systems trying to do transformation, there is a growing number of private equity experiments to provide care to the Medicare Advantage population, to provide primary care. And I put just a few names out there. And as I say, these are, um, are these data might be about a year old now in certain of these cases. But I mostly want to show you that there are some very significant national leaders involved in these. There are some companies that are really working on doing this kind of work with social determinants in the urban landscape, in Medicare Advantage plans, focusing on primary care shortage areas where for all older adults might live. And we can expect to see that private industry really, I think, burgeoning over the next few years alongside more traditional health systems. So quickly to align with some of the recommendations that, that Joanne went through, I would say what we're learning from our project is um, if we think about that recommendation to expand that pipeline, we are seeing many different workforce roles. We especially, I think, want to lift up the fact that there are a lot of things happening in home and community. And a lot of our nurses and physicians 
don't have a lot of training in home and community. A lot of them are trained in acute care facilities. So we've been thinking a lot about how to equip people to do this work in the community, in the office setting, in the home, in the mobile care space, and thinking, as I showed you, about the ratio of staff within teams and what's the pipeline we will need? What's the right number when we see so much variation in how people are employed and how practices hire? We saw remarkably few caregivers in our site visits and remarkably few programs focused on them. And we think this is a gap to be addressed. We have other survey data coming out which really looks at caregiver perceptions and provider perceptions of whether caregivers really are in the team and how they're in the team. We would echo the need to support this home care workforce. We saw and heard from in our focus groups a lot of people living alone. And that home care workforce is so essential, especially for those who may not have family caregivers to help them. And we've been thinking a lot about that group. Technology, I think we, we see the promise of technology in a number of ways. We saw a lot of shiny EHRs and a couple of cities, especially Denver, where they really have managed to to wire up and share data across a number of care settings. But a lot of that technology is largely lacking in the home and largely inaccessible to patients and their caregivers. So that's an area I think that really needs more. A lot of payment model innovation, and I think that will continue to drive innovation. The population of patients, especially as we look forward, is far going to be far more diverse than our professional workforce is, except at that most front line of direct care worker. And I think we need to, to continue to think about that. Um, also, the issues of professional culture are very real, and the need to work and encourage interprofessional work to kind of alleviate some of the clashes that we see at the front lines are very important. And finally, um, tracking the workforce. How do we do that given the variation we see? How do we measure it at a system level, a practice level, a community level in the home? Um, how will we understand what supply is needed given increasingly flexible and new roles out there? And that's <laughs> those are the questions I'm going to leave Michelle with because She's the expert there, and uh, love love to hear her comments on it. Thank you, Karen. This is Michelle, and I guess I am uh, here, so I want to say thank you for inviting me to react and respond today. Um, I really enjoyed listening to both of the presentations. Ensuring an adequate workforce to support the care of people with serious illness in the community is is an important and a critical undertaking. It's not just important in terms of providing a high quality of care, but at the end of the day, having an adequate workforce is really about having access to health care, period. Given the aging of our population, the what I would call fast track recommendations on how to hasten health workforce development activities in the next few years, and the kind of work that Karen and others are doing it underscores the importance of focusing on this particular population. From the federal government perspective, the domains that came out of the Workforce Summit that Joanne presented on and which were recently published in the special issue of JAGS are, are spot on. These are the same general areas where we, the federal government, are, are trying to move the dial in terms of policy focus and programmatic investments. And in that grain, of course, we hope that others will follow suit. While listening to Joanne go through the recommendation areas and listening to Karen's research, which gave us the empirical evidence supporting them, I think what became quite clear to me is that each of the recommendation areas is related to or dependent on the others. For example, we can't talk about expanding the workforce pipeline without tracking the workforce to know its status. Or we can't talk about supporting the home care workforce without advocating for new payment models. That said, um, and again, listening to the two presentations, there's a few areas which clearly rose to the top in my mind uh, because they're easier, e either easier to act upon or their impact would be so strong if we were actually able to do them. 
Joanne's first recommendation area um, and discussed by Karen relates to expanding the pipeline. For example, funding of relevant health workforce programs is very achievable right now. In fact, as Joanne mentioned, the Bureau of Health Workforce in the Health Resources and Services Administration in HHS just competed the Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program, or GWEP as it's known, and Geriatrics Academic Career Award, uh, GACA programs. And both of these should be awarded by the end of the fiscal year. Further, things like increasing the clinical experiences and the care of people with a serious illness are also extremely achievable right now and require pretty straightforward policy changes especially if we're talking about government programs which fund training and education or healthcare systems who offer the clinical settings for the training. Another area which, while listening um, to the, this past hour, which to me is perhaps a harder lift, but the impact would be huge, is around what I think of as new or evidence-based models and ways of providing care. First, this would include the domain of recommendations around incorporating family caregivers into healthcare teams. To me, this plays into the more recent policy push, but longstanding activity that aging services in the aging world is focused on, which is addressing the social determinants of health by the healthcare and health support system. Karen's presentation talking about the care teams for me really drove this point home. The evidence base and arguments for supporting them is out there but they're not always disseminated past the typical stakeholders. I think disseminating to a wider atypical audience like those in education or in the workforce development worlds or beyond could help get more people thinking about policy and programmatic ways to incorporate family caregivers into the healthcare team. To be clear, I'm not suggesting creating brand new programs like the Family Caregiver Support Program at ACL, but rather making programmatic and policy shifts similar to how the GWET program was re-envisioned five years ago, which better incorporated these individuals into existing program and policy. The second domain of recommendations around improving the way we provide care was in regards to technology. I think leveraging technology broadly has been part of the national healthcare drumbeat for more than a decade now, and currently there's a hunger for empirical data on how it is being employed in this case, specifically how it's being used to advance patient-centered team care. Uh, quick access to information for all members of a patient's care team, as Karen noted, and as she mentioned that we're seeing in the private investments in new care models, that's key in providing efficient and high-quality care to individuals with serious illness. One concrete recommendation of the summit, um, as Joanne mentioned, was to support the sharing of EHR data on social determinants of health with community programs and health support occupations. This, is, to me, is a very clear and actionable way of doing what Karen emphasized, and I think it could be very impactful. So I know we're running out of time. Um, in a nutshell, I think strengthening the workforce is about improving access and quality of care. It is a linchpin in terms of delivering care to people living with serious illness. The two excellent presentations we just listened to not only gave us a high-level path with recommendations on how to advance workforce planning efforts around this population, but also gave us a very specific evidence-based research example on how and why and what those recommendations look like on the ground. So with that, I will turn it back to David and say thank you for listening today. All right. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Karen and Joanne. With that said, we are at the top of the hour. However, if y'all can stick around for just a few minutes, I would like to fill a, a, you know, a few questions from the audience, if, if you can. Um, Joanne, Karen, can you stick around for about five, ten more minutes? Absolutely. You got it. Oh, great, great. Well, Michelle, you actually stole some of the questions I came up with, to be quite honest with you, but I would like to reframe one. Uh, you were discussing, you know, how realistic some of these recommendations are. Perhaps each of you could give me your perspective on it, like how realistic the various recommendations are, like pick out a couple that you think are very achievable, but also of your recommendations, which ones do you think will be most challenging? That is a very good question. Um, I think anything related to payment reform is a challenge. Um, you know, I think CMS has made incredible headway, and there is clearly a commitment from the current administration to continue that progress. But it's slow and challenging because we don't really know what payment reform models are going to be the most effective 
in improving the health of our population. But that said, there is, there is continuous improvement and we should really herald those advances. We also should recognize that states and private payers have been um, essential in some of this work as well. There are a lot of states that are requiring Medicaid managed care programs and a lot of Medicare Advantage plans have been very forward thinking. Um, I think the other area that'll be very challenging is around health information technologies. Uh, there's been so much press over the past year about how difficult and challenging EHRs have been for many clinicians. There's so many needs for improvement. And so um, I, I think we need to be attentive to the risk that adding more requirements to EHRs or asking EHR vendors to do more may be suboptimal if the current problems are not addressed adequately. And I, this is Karen. Um, I think the things that we see, as Michelle said, happening already are the, the system is generating lots of new roles and lots of new pipeline. I mean, we've seen a huge growth in the number of nurses, nurse practitioners, and, and physician assistants, um, as well as social work is growing dramatically, community health work is growing dramatically. The National Academy is going to have a, a new report out on the social care workforce sometime in the next several months, and you know we look forward to their recommendations. I think that the we are seeing this tremendous amount of investment in the models of care. So whether the financing can keep up with that or not is, a, I think, another question. I think Joanne and I and Michelle are ready to track the workforce in the best ways we know how. And I, I think there's a lot of energy around diversity and cultural competence outside of workforce um, in our society more broadly, and a lot of good energy going into that nationally from health systems. So I'm optimistic on those fronts. Michelle, do you have anything to add? No, I think uh, in terms of the easiest, I sort of made my comments, but I, yeah. I think Joanne, <laughs> yeah, Joanne and Karen are, are spot on again. Okay, great. And I do have a question from our audience. Did the summit panel consider the role of emergency medical service providers? They are struggling with some of the same questions and new roles such as community paramedics have been created to try and solve some of these issues. Uh, one of the challenges with the EMS is linking their EHR to hospital primary care EHRs. The last part's a bit of a follow-up. Um, so we we saw a couple of um, we, we've seen a couple of companies in the the mobile emergency health space and the community based paramedic place. My colleague here at Mass General, Lisa Iazzoni, has a PCORI funded grant to look at EMS and paramedics in their role, and there's been some great work in Colorado. I think that. That space is hitting up against, as you say, a lot of regulatory issues um, in scope around medications and what kind of care can be done and by whom. And I think that we can expect to see it grow, but maybe a little more slowly than, than some would like, um, given some of the challenges. Yeah, I, we did not explicitly during the summit talk about community paramedics, although I think they would have been under the umbrella of all the other conversations. I also would like to point you to a study we did under our Health Workforce Research Center that's supported by HRSA on the roles of community paramedics in long-term care. So you can go to our website, which is um, healthworkforce.ucsf.edu, and you can find that report that was led by Janet Kaufman here in California. All right, thank you, Joanne and Karen. With that said, do you have any final thoughts on the summit that you'd like to share with our audience today? I think we encourage everybody to um, take a look at the recommendations that came out of that, out of this effort. Um, you know, some pe people may disagree with and we'd like to hear about that and other priorities may come to the surface. But we think that there's a broad challenge to work on moving these recommendations forward. In the end, it's about the population and the patients who need care. So any progress that we can make to help them, whether it's these recommendations or other great ideas out there, 
We hope that there is um, a lot of opportunity to advance and to prepare our system to better care for these populations than we do today. And um, this is Karen. I would say I like to keep my focus on the fact that we have a very confusing health system that does a lot of great things, but also creates a lot of confusion for people who need more support and coordination. And so the more that we can do to find models that are simpler, a little more efficient, and a little more friendly for people who may need them to be that way um, is, is our goal. And I hope we can keep in mind the people who are doing this work both for pay and not for pay to try to solve the system failures that we have. Okay, thank you. And thank you out there for attending our webinar. Just to let you know, we will be posting our slides shortly to our website. So if you want to download them, check back very quickly at healthworkforcet.org. We hope to see you again in the future. Thank you and have a good day.